Warning, the video you're about to watch contains mathematics at the level of pre-calculus. All material has an assumed prerequisite of college algebra and trigonometry. While some prerequisite topics are reviewed briefly, a more thorough review of these entrance topics can be found by searching the web. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, Professor of Mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is a continuation of exponentials and logarithms, and this is for pre-calculus, so there's a lot of kind of embedded quick review within this video series. To be honest, it is assumed that you have seen everything about exponentials and logarithms up to this point. So it's just a kind of a run through of the major concepts. And because of that, I like to embed a little bit of calculus in here since you're all heading into calculus. It's very important that you see this and that you get used to this. You want to be a leg up over those other students who are going into calculus. You want to be better um, and be the top of your class. So this is meant for you. Calculus and the natural base. So before we move forward, let's take a diversion into calculus. To do this work, we need to recall a form, uh, formula sorry, from elementary algebra. Theorem, compound interest. Right? You guys remember this from good old elementary algebra. The value of an initial investment, which we'll call P0, earning interest at a rate of R, which is uh, our decimal version of a percentage rate, which we allow to compound n times per year for t years. Well, the amount we have after that time is given by this formula. And you should remember that. That has been several years of use for you at this point. So, um, and there's a little note here. Technically, the time need not be per year, but that is the typical period with which we are concerned. So I, I think rather than going forward, I'm just gonna kind of off to the side here, give a quick example. So for an example, you have an initial investment of let's say a hundred dollars, cause that's kind of the easiest investment to deal with, right? And let's say you wanna invest that for, oh, I don't know, say three years. And you're gonna allow it to compound or compound, whichever you prefer. Um, Let's say it compounds quarterly. So that means the number of times per year that it will gain a little bit of interest is four, four times per year. If it's monthly, it's 12 times per year. If it's daily, it's 365 times per year. And then let's go ahead and give ourselves a annual percentage rate. So let's say the rate itself is maybe 6.5%. Now, as a decimal, that's 0 0.065. The way you would set up this formula then, you would say, oh, the amount we have at, after, sorry, three years. So I'm, I said, you know what, let's not set T actually. Let's, let's keep T as an unknown so that we can just have this uh, formula work for any number of years. That's a little bit better, I think. So P of T, the amount that we have after t years is going to be the amount we invested times the quantity again stealing from this formula over here one plus that rate 0 0.065 but we're splitting it into four chunks so we get one fourth of that rate every quarter so every three months we get a fourth of that rate and we wouldn't just put T up here to say, oh, you know, it's after a year, that's what you have or something like that. Because in a single year, we get interest four times. So that's why it's raised to the N T because in a single year, you get to compound that interest N times. And that would be the formula for that situation. hundred dollars invested at six and a half percent compounding quarterly for t years and then you can let t equal three if you want to know how much you have after three years all right so that's kind of the review of how that works and how to set it up now let's continue forward here because i i wrote this all out to really get us into calculus 
So if we consider that we're only investing a dollar, and again, 100 or one dollar, those are kind of easy ones to work with. So uh, we're only gonna invest a dollar. So in this case, we're just gonna let P not equal one and only for one year. So T is equal to one. Then the amount we have at the end of the year is this. Right? You just replace T with one and P not with one. Okay, no biggie. Right now, that's should be okay with you. Then we move forward with a little more with our example here. While it's not realistic, let's assume our rate is 100%. Now 100%, you should know, is equal to 1.00. So that's why we let R equal one. Then our expression simplifies down to this. Now remember, this is if you have an initial population of money of $1 and you're allowing this to only compound over a year and still it compounds n times over that year, but you're only allowing it to run for a year and you're giving yourself a 100% rate, which is awesome, right? I would love to invest in something and get 100% back uh, every year. That would be so rad. But this awesomeness actually has something to do with nature. So let's go ahead and approximate the horizontal asymptote for the function by building a table of values. And this is the function we're considering right here. Uh, yeah, my highlighter's on, so let's go right here. It's the same actual function. These two, uh, these two expressions are the same. I've just replaced n with x's, that's all. Because when you're evaluating functions, um, you don't want your inputs to be ends necessarily because technically we we reserve the variable n for a natural number and functions um, generally are continuous they don't have to be by the way um, so nobody yell at me but it is possible uh, that uh, or it is likely that when you're dealing with a function it's continuous all right so let's go ahead and approximate the horizontal asymptote of that function by building a table of values and if you have not seen any of my previous videos where I showcase how to build a table within Desmos, then I'll just show you here. I created the function. I didn't want the graph of it, so I actually turned that graph off by just clicking the uh, circle there. And then I'm gonna add a table right here. Now, normally in Desmos, your tables are meant to be uh, filled by you. Uh, however, you can have the ta table autofill uh, by replacing the y value here with your function. Note, uh, really quickly, the input variable for your table is x sub one, it's not x. Um, that's because really Desmos does not wanna use x or reuse x if it's being used in a function. So we're just gonna keep that input variable as x sub one and we'll let the y value be f evaluated at that x sub one. To get the subscript, by the way, it's shift and then the minus key. So now that we've done that, I'll go ahead and hop down over to here and we're being asked to estimate like what's the long-term behavior of this function. So if I just plugged in, let's pretend one, I can't plug in zero by the way, because zero would cause division by zero. So if I plug in one, I get an output of two. If I plug in 10, I get an output of two point, roughly six, and then a hundred, and then a thousand, and then 10 to the fourth, that's a little bit faster. And you'll see that these numbers are approaching something, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth. And you can see now they're really definitely approaching, the outputs are approaching 2.718, uh, two and some change. Let's see if we can go 10 to the seventh. That's one with seven zeros behind it. So, uh, what is that? Six zero, so it's 10 million. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. No, that's right. It's 10 million. So you keep going along and you could see that it's definitely approaching some fantastically interesting number, 2.71828, uh, maybe one eight, who knows? Uh, let me go ahead and just do one last one here. Yeah. All right. So what does that mean? 
Now here is uh, what's very important about that function. Remember that function was built by a compound interest formula. That function was built from the formula P naught one plus R over N to the NT, but we decided let's just take a look after one year and let's just invest $1 and let's suppose that we get a hundred percent return rate. And that's how this function was built. But it turns out this function, this idea that you start with an object, an object, let me put this in here, one object, and you just want to know what it looks like, what that object looks like after one year, and you're allowing it to grow at a hundred percent rate. Now that hundred percent rate is the part that a lot of people have a hard time with, but don't worry, that falls off from this conversation event eventually. Um, but this is what what we're what we were doing in that problem by allowing x to go to large numbers, which I'll just say to infinity. But we're really letting x go to discreetly large numbers. However, uh, you get the point. We're allowing x to go to ten uh, to a million, to ten million, to a hundred million, to a billion. Eventually, you're just saying what is ha what's happening as x goes to infinity. And remember what X stands for is the number of compounding periods. So if the number of compounding periods tends to infinity, what happens is really what we're asking in this situation. What happens if we let the thing compound not once per day, not once per minute, not once per second, not once per nanosecond, but once per per moment, whatever a moment is. So it has an infinite number of compounding periods. And we found the value of that to be 2.7182818 is what we saw on our approximation because we only went out to that many decimal places. But it turns out that decimal expansion, if you did that expansion forever and ever and ever, we think that's such an important number, we label it like we would label pi, because pi is such an important number or a constant in uh, in the universe, honestly. And E, which is what we label this number, is also an incredibly important number. It's one of the universal constants is what we would call it. And so it is called the natural base and in calculus notation, we would write it this way. The limit, as we allow the inputs here to rush off to infinity for one plus one over x to x, to the x, sorry. We're gonna define that to be the number e. And in fact, usually in, in mathematics, if you define something, it's with a triple equality. That means I'm defining this to be the number e. Uh, which is 2.718. So this limit ends up being roughly 2.718281828, right? Um, but we'll define that to be a number E. Now, just reading off of this down below, the natural base leads directly to the natural exponential function E to the X. That's, you should have uh, plenty of experience with that, but I'm just telling you that's where it comes from. It's continuous compounding. Uh, which rep oh, which represents continuous compounding. I didn't even read that. This is the type of compounding that nature takes on. A flower, for example, does not suddenly increase in height by 12% every week. Instead, it is continuously growing. So that should make sense. Nature goes through a continuous pattern of growth. It doesn't just all of a sudden sporadically jump in size like a tree, a plant, a person. We don't grow in size once every year or some silliness like that. We're continuously growing. And on a molecular level, we're discreetly growing to be very honest with you. But from our larger perspective, it's a continuous growth. Growth. So let's go back to what we did in the very first example of the last video, which is graphing. And we're gonna graph this natural based exponential function. We're gonna state the domain the range and the asymptote. And at this point, it should not be 
anything that's crazy. It shouldn't take us too long to do this. The only thing I need to remind you of is that if there is a coefficient in front of x there, you should factor it off of both x and the constant in that exponent. So I'm going to rewrite this as negative e raised to the 2 times the quantity x minus 1 half and then minus 3. The reason why is because that will actually showcase the shift. The shift here is to the right one half units and up, or sorry, down three units. The two right here just means that we are, in fact, let me use different inks for that. And maybe I should just go from left to right. So this guy right here, that's our typical reflection about the X axis. And this guy right here, just means let's go ahead and compress our X values um, by a factor of one half, which means uh, compress horizontally by a factor of one half. It's gonna multiply all the X values by a half. And then the next one, let's see, the next two actually. Well, I'll do it one at a time. That's a right shift by one half, and then obviously a down shift by three. We have everything we need to graph this exponential function. First of all, we should note the exponential base there, the natural base, is greater than one. So uh, this exponential function is initially growing. That's y equals e to the x. It goes through zero comma one and one comma e. You can test it out if you want to, but that's exactly what happens. Now we're just gonna rotate it and um, yeah, let's just rotate it. I was gonna do two things at once, but I'll just rotate it. So this is zero comma negative one and one comma negative E. And uh, also note, there is a horizontal asymptote in both cases, and I'm not super concerned about being uh, super rigid with my graphing right now. I'll reserve that to the final step. Uh, the next one there is compress horizontally by a factor, I'll zoom in, by a factor of one half which means multiply all the X values by one half. That's just the easiest way to say that. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this last graph and multiply all the X values by a half. And that will lead to a really quick graph here. It still goes through zero comma negative one, but now it goes through one half comma negative E. So I'm just gonna go ahead and chicken scratch that out. It doesn't, um, what's interesting with exponentials and um, reciprocal functions is that you don't really get to see uh, the effect of a horizontal compression unless it's uh, very, very radical, like an incredibly large compression. You usually don't see it, it's hard to see. Anyhow, the last two moves, which I will then have a nice pretty graph for, would be the shift down by three and the shift right by a half. So let me go ahead and take some time to graph out the axes. I didn't bother like using a ruler or something like that. It's just not my style. Um, but one thing I want to know, note here is that when it shifts down by three units, that horizontal asymptote also shifts down by three units. So I'm going to go ahead and in red, just draw a horizontal line here at Y equals three. Again, this level of precision I expect from my students. Uh, note, I don't even bother with a um, with a ruler, uh, but I, I try not to make it too wiggly, right? So the two points in question that I will call my anchor points are zero comma negative one and one half comma negative E. We're gonna go ahead and move all their X values one unit or one half unit right. So add one half to those X values. So the point at zero comma negative one will now be at one half comma, and then you'll drop the Y value by three. So one half comma four. So I'll go ahead and mark out here. Um, maybe I'll mark the X axis. This will be one. So obviously this is one half. And we know this is three right there. So this must be four. So one half comma negative four. If I said it was four, I meant negative four. 
And then the other point was at one half comma negative E. Now you're gonna add a half to its X value, so it's at one, and you're gonna drop the Y value by three more points. So it'll be at one comma negative E minus three. One comma negative E, which is 2.7 and change, so that's negative E right about there. And you're gonna drop that by another three units. So one, uh, let me do this, two and possibly three units. So it's right here is one comma negative E and lose another three. And then you can go ahead and graph, whoops, the function. Let me get that back there. I was trying to be cute and erase something. All right, so I'm gonna try to graph this function. I do a lot of scratching to graph here. Remember, it's gonna approach that horizontal asymptote It'll never touch the horizontal asymptote. Also remember, most functions can cross their horizontal asymptotes, but exponentials cannot. So there we go. That's a pretty decent graph of that exponential function, base E. Now, continuing forward, um, with this idea of using exponential functions in a calculus setting. There's nothing more calculus-y than the difference quotient, honestly. That is sort of the basis of a lot of our calculus, that and infinities. So let's go ahead and evaluate the difference quotient for the natural-based exponential function e to the x. Now, people will do this in several steps, but I do not. We happen to know that our function f is e to the x. And so if we're asked to evaluate a fraction where the numerator, maybe I should say it this way, where the denominator is just a simple h, but the numerator is the function evaluated at a plus h minus the function evaluated at a, well, guess what? That's about as good as you can get. Now, there is a little bit more I could possibly do here, but I wouldn't expect it from a pre-calculus student just because there's no real need to do this. However, um, by the way, I should say, that is all you can do normally. You'd be stuck right there. However, I do want to showcase something. If you watch or if you remember the laws of exponents, you know that e to the a plus h is e to the a times e to the h and then minus e to the a all over h and you can see in that numerator you have two factors that are exactly the same so you can factor those out so i'm going to go ahead and factor those out of this fraction e to the a times a fraction where we have e to the h minus one all over h and that's about as good as you can get with something like this uh, until you hit calculus. Now, in calculus, you'll find out something about the natural based function that is super awesome and it allows for uh, deeper computations and something called derivatives. But for right now, that's about as good as you can get with evaluating the difference quotient for this function. Not an exciting example, uh, but just still a reminder of what a difference quotient is. It's always f of a plus h minus f of a over h, uh, and is incredibly powerful in calculus. Now it is, I'm just going to read this. It is commonly the case that you will be working with the natural base as long as you're going into a field that's science-based. As such, you'll need to know how to convert from a non-natural base to the natural base. This does happen quite a bit, actually, where you're given, for example, you could see this right here, you're given an exponential function, but the base of that is not E. Well, because most of us work base E, it's important to be able to convert that. And because you've seen how to do this in the past, I don't derive it, instead I just mention the how-to. How do you do that? So how to convert from base not e to base e. Notice there's a difference between those two functions already. 
The first one is P naught B to the T. The second is P naught E to the R T, which a lot of students will call PERT. Um, and that's because B does not transform over to E exactly. It has to be uh, that it has to transform over to E to the R. Let's see how that's done. Note, we really just need B to the T equaling R to the T because the P naughts are identical. So I just need to know, hey, how is B to the T the same as E to the R T? Also note, E to the R T by a law of exponents, this law of exponents right here, B to the M raised to the nth power is equal to b to the mn. Well, if I have e to the product of powers, I can re rewrite it as e to the r raised to the t. This guy right here. So it turns out that b raised to the t is the same thing as e to the r raised to the t. That is, b must equal e to the r. That's what we're going for. So we need to know uh, if somebody hands us a base, like we're going to be handed in the next example, the 1.2 right there. How do you exchange that for e to the r? Well, you set 1.2 equal to e to the rth power. It's this right here. And you solve it for r. And then you're done. So convert that function into an exponential function with the natural base. Well, let's take a look here. 1.2 is what the base of that function is, and I want that equal to e, which is 2.71828, and so on and so forth, raised to the r power. e is not a variable, it's a constant. So we need to solve this equation for r. And you should recall that you can take the natural log of both sides. That is from two full courses of working with natural logs and exponentials. You can take the natural log of both sides. And you should also know that the natural log is base E and natural log of base E of E to the R is the same thing as R. So we have found that R is going to be the natural log of 1.2. Thus, if you want to exchange that 1.2 out for a natural, or so sorry, for an exponential base, natural base that is, you can as long as you write it as e to the natural log of 1.2. And then you still have that T on there. Because remember, that's what B is. B base here uh, is E to the R. We found out from there that R was natural log of 1.2. And then now you can do one extra little move here, which is to use the uh, law of exponents, the powers to powers multiply. And so you get P naught E to the natural log of 1.2 t and that is completely rewritten with the natural base again very important for you if you're going into science not engineering actually engineering on the other hand you will probably use non-natural uh bases i mean i'm not saying you'll never use them you'll never use natural bases but you often use other bases by the way, within that example, just as I was going through it, my brain was kind of thinking about the other examples, and I realized I didn't even bother stating domain and range and asymptote of this uh, right here. So I'm just going to go back to this example. Sorry about that. G of x is equal to e negative e to the 2x minus 1 minus 3. Domain of any exponential function is still all real numbers. The range of this you can see the y values dip down to negative infinity and climb all the way up to three, not including three. And finally, the uh, horizontal asymptote has the equation y equals three. Sorry about that. I just, when I was working on that last example, 
I, I realized, wait, there was more to that first example. Now I'm really trying to get you into a calculus mindset. So you've already gone through a full trig course because you're in pre-calculus. You've had a full semester of just trig or maybe trig in college algebra. Um, ideally it'd be a full semester of just trig, but even at my college, we don't have a full semester of just trig. However, it's assumed if you're in pre-calculus that you've mastered trigonometry. So you know all there's all there is to know about trig for the most part. Um, but turns out there is a special class of functions that are similar, but not exactly the same as trigonometric functions. Trigonometric functions are known as circular functions because they're based on the unit circle. Well, there's another family of functions called hyperbolic functions that are based on hyperbolas. And they're defined as follows. And I'm not going to go into a deep derivation here, so don't freak out. This is just an aside, um, but an important aside because you'll encounter these within calculus and they end up being somewhat important as you move forward. If you're going to go into differential equations, for example, um, they are very helpful in differential equations. So the hyperbolic sine and cosine. The hyperbolic sine is defined to be the following. Notice the notation is not sin of x, it's sin h for the hyperbolic sine. Um, and we call that the cinch, cinch, okay? And actually, probably pronounce, uh, to pronoun pronounce it, it probably pronounces better like that, cinch. Okay. Um, anyway, it's defined to be e to the x minus e to the negative x, all that being divided by two. So you can see why this fits naturally when you're talking about exponential functions with the natural base, because that's what the cinch is defined to be. It's a combination of the natural based exponential functions. There's also a hyperbolic cosine called the cosh, and that's e to the x plus e to the negative x divided by two. I don't expect my students to memorize this this early. I expect them to know this by the time they get to calculus or actually while they're within calculus. We do this within our calculus course and you will have to get used to them, but they're really nice to work with. There's also a tanch, a hyperbolic tangent. There's a coseach, a hyperbolic cosecant. There's a seach, which is a hyperbolic secant. And there's a cough which is a hyperbolic cotangent. There's also a ton of identities associated with this, just like you have the identities associated with the sine and cosine functions. For example, you know that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. There's something similar, but not exactly the same for cinch and cosh. All right. So let's see, there's a lot of theory and usefulness behind these functions in calculus, but for now, I just introduced them so that you know they exist. We're just, the only thing we're gonna do really is just prove that cosh is an even function. If I'm doing that, that likely means that in your homework or something like that, if you're one of my students, you might have to prove that cinch is an odd function. That's kind of how they go, they go hand in hand like that. So to prove a function is odd, just recall, you insert into the function negative x. If you're proving it's odd, you want to insert negative x, it'll come out as negative cosh of x. But this is not odd, we're, we're trying to prove it's even. So if it's even, through a series of logical deductive arguments, you should arrive at the cosh of negative x equaling the cosh of x. If that's the case, that would be even. Right, that's where we want to arrive at. So let's see if we can get there. All I need to do is use the actual definition of the cosh right there. So I'll create a little fraction, put two downstairs, and I have e raised to, instead of the x, it's going to be the negative x plus. Instead of e to the negative x, I'll have e to the negative negative x. That's all. It's actually pretty fast, so let's go ahead and continue forward. This is going to equal e to the negative x plus e to the x all over 2, which is equal to, I'm just going to use the, I'm going to be very mathy here. I'm going to use the commutivity property 
of addition or commutative property of addition if you want to call it that so this is e to the x plus e to the negative x i just rewrite addition in the other order and by the way if you look up here that's literally the definition of the cosh so this is equal to the cosh so cosh of negative x is cosh of x which implies cosh is even there we go that's the proof of it qed so to recap um, we've covered the natural base here um, we've introduced hyperbolic sine and cosine uh, only because you're going to see those in calculus so i want you to be very familiar with them uh, we've talked about how to derive the natural base by using limits uh, which is a calculus concept um, and all of these things that I keep saying are calculus concepts. It's not that you're required to know them in pre-calculus, but I always find it's much better to introduce the idea of a calculus concept before you touch into calculus, because you're in a course called pre-calculus. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes obstacles getting in our way comes effects more than we can sometimes see things for what they are and work together until you feel at peace as listen close don't talk too much that isn't kosher you may really hurt inside it doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry